So great to be here. Thank you so much. I want to talk about um, something that is way over height and where there's a lot of mystique, but it's very, very easy to understand. And we're going to get a real live uh, lesson from somebody who lives in the trenches uh, after I finish talking who can set me straight <coughs> on, on how it really works. Elias is the chief executive officer of Patel, and I'm a, I'm a very proud investor in Patel as well. So. Um, so what I want to talk about tonight is <clears throat> that if we don't, uh, if we do not embrace artificial intelligence, we will be finished. AI is not out to take our job. AI will take our job if we don't embrace AI. That's the message I have. If you don't embrace it, you're going to lose your job. If you embrace it, you're good to go. There's so much ways to help. And then what I want to talk about is <clears throat> tonight about the lizard brain. <clears throat> and the lizard brain, uh, we are not that uh, old a uh, species. Our species is one of the youngest species on Earth. We and we've had about 890 iterations of generations of humans. That's not a lot. And so we have a uh, amygdala on the base of our brain right above the tongue, which we can get to when we are afraid. And when we are afraid, we get a lot of habits that are the worst possible ways to assess risk. Because when we are afraid, we do four things. I left one of the Fs out. Uh, we want to, whoops, we want to uh, feed, we want to fight, and we want to refreeze, and, and then the other one, uh, which we will not do in such polite company. Uh, and so this is a group, primitive group reaction that causes us to become tribal, and we shut down. And what is a CFA? Well, what is an MBA? I've been teaching MBA students for 19 years. And, and I, I think that, that so much of all, all of what we do is assessing risk. The risk of a bank, the risk, the risk of starting a bank, the risk of starting an oil rig, the risk of starting an insurance company, the risk of starting a, can, a confectionery company, the risk of starting a petrochemical factory. It's, it's assessing risk. And as a group, so often, especially as a group, so often our ability to, to assess risk is terrible. When oftentimes as individuals, we are often very good at assessing risk. At the group level, we often fall apart. And artificial intelligence is trying to get away from the terrible decisions we make often as a group when we are afraid and we become tribal. And this is really happening right now in the world, uh, right? And so we need to have a way to take uh, closing in, retreating uh, risk behavior. That's irrational. And I want to talk about this tonight, and I want to talk about the methods that are being used. <clears throat> This is everything you learn about in behavioral economics. I don't want to go through all these, but there's 21. We have 21 blind spots. That's a lot. If someone said, it's a great car, you should buy it. The car is $20,000, but the car has 21 blind spots. <laughs> Would you buy that car? No, you wouldn't. Right? We have 21 blind spots. We need to be careful. And those are the 21. I won't go into them. Give me that book for a second. In, in my book, and f f four of you, he's going, where's our man? Where's our, our CFA Society Chief Executive Officer? Where did he go? Uh, he's going to come and give you guys a number, and we're going to uh, uh, raffle off four copies of the book later on. Uh, and then when I'm finished talking, you're going to set us straight. Okay. But the first two chapters of this book talks all about that. Yeah, he's, gonna, he's getting the paper ready to uh, have everyone uh, get four <coughs> copies of the book raffled off, and you're going to help me do this, right? Have we ever met before? Yeah. No, no, you're supposed to say no. <laughs> we've never met before. This is going to be my assistant tonight. We've never met before, right? 
Uh, and so, uh, so, so, so these 21 go, we go through this. Here is the thing that I want to um, talk about. I'm doing a lot of work in my own research company for my clients are like hedge funds, pension funds, mutual funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds, Singapore, China, and other Middle Eastern sovereign wealth funds. And I, I, we're, we're right now, about right now, we're starting to really tip into abandoning traditional research and going into this. And what I want to say to you is that 95% of all of the stuff that is artificial intelligence is everything you already know. Because those... Um, all that dimensionality reduction, data correlation, linear classifiers, decision tree, instance space, clustering regression, you all know that. These are all tools that are 30 years old. The important thing to remember on this is these things down here, deep learning, transfer learning, and reinforcement learning are the same things as that, but there's an effort of self-teaching. The, 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 the growing consensus is 5% of everything you need is in uh, machine learning. 95% of all of the AI is done in the traditional tools you already know. And so don't be afraid of this. Embrace it and figure it out. All you're doing with AI is we are looking at vast numbers of uh, data points. And, and uh, Elias is going to give us a sense of the numbers of data points you're talking about, even for like a company that's whatever, five years old, right? Three that is looking at you know, tens of millions of data points. In, in three years, and, and you're talking about, you know, a, com a, a company like Grab, which is Southeast Asia, which didn't exist like eight years ago, has like a billion data points. That's all this is. This is this is 30-year-old statistical analysis for uh, data points that are um, 10 million, 50 million, 100 million. That's why uh, I keep telling people, and you, you, you've heard it now recently in BlackRock. You hear it in UBS. Today I was reading another one, um, another one of the big asset management companies. If you do not know um, Python, do not apply for a job. UBS and BlackRock have now said, if you don't know Python, do not apply for a job. I told my MBA students, by the end of next year, if you don't know Python, you will not get a job. So Python becomes very, very valuable. Hi, hey, my dear, come up, sit here. Welcome. How are you? Thank you. Awesome. And so, so I, I, I would implore you to look at something like Python as something that you need to learn in the evenings. Um, or, you, and by the way, anybody who's a CEO of a research company. Get somebody in and teach your analysts Python. This should be an in-course, uh, this an in-work course, and it should be mandatory. Absolutely, positively mandatory. So the point I want to make is something like Python is using traditional statistical methods. You're just using large data sets. That's all you're doing. And increasingly, I think the machine learning stuff, which you know Google does very, very well. In almost all of the stuff that I'm hearing from large financial institutions, large hedge funds, it's not being used. Because it's too complicated, it's too complex, it's too academic, and it's not yet ready for the market. But the stuff on top is. And what are the four things? If I can summarize the four problems, the four human blind spots, if I could summarize them into four, and then this, and by the way, anybody who wants this PowerPoint, please have it. Um, so, right? So you can just give it to anybody who wants it. So, so groupthink. <clears throat> groupthink is very simple. Uh, you know, you've seen all these studies about groupthink, uh, where we ask one person to leave the room, and then you, you have like three sticks, and then you agree one stick is shorter than the other two, and the, the person comes back in. And everyone agrees that the shorter stick is actually bigger than, every, than the other stick. That person will agree that's a bigger stick because everybody else agrees. 
And there's all these studies over and over again that we get um, bushwhacked by the group. So if the group knows better, I must be wrong. That is bold. Right? And we need to have ways. And one of the things I always tell people, and it's happening more and more, anybody here is left-handed, raise your hand. Oh my god. Half the people are introverts, half the people are extroverts. Listen to the introverts. They're observers. They have great insight. And the blabbermouth, I'm an introvert. The blabbermouth extroverts, they never shut up, right, introverts? <laughs> right? They're all they're all they're all they're all like nodding their heads, right? And so introverted observers have great <coughs> insight. And, and so so this is where in groupthink we need to have ways to um, to counter uh, what's going on. And there are methods in the in the book that talk about how you can do this. The next one is uh, the fear of authority. And I, I think I think the whole thing about the Asia thing, especially more of the East Asia thing about filial piety, I think that's just like nonsense. I think everybody is afraid of the boss. So if the boss is right, I can't be right. Right? AI gets around this chronic problem of being terrible at assessing risk because I my risks that I assess must be wrong because my boss says it's wrong. It happens all the time. I've seen it all the time in research, in asset management, in private equity. It happens all the time. And we need to get around that. And then lack of imagination. That's the number one problem, the lack of imagination. When you read a lot about resilience and how people who, keep, who fail can talk about resilience, because uh, this guy is like, a, you're an awesome example of resilience, and, 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 and how that happens. And, 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 and with resilience, you, those people can anticipate shortcomings. They can anticipate failure. And the capacity for anticipating and uh, imagining <coughs> failure and catastrophe is very important. And, and humans are terrible at that, because we are forever hopeful. <laughs> and we need ways to get around that in assessing risk. And the last one, uh, and, and, and also very important, life is very irrational. And so we need ways to get around that, that hyper-rationality that we attach to assessing risk. And this is what all these tools of AI are designed to Artificial intelligence, I want to tell you what artificial intelligence is. And then, then you're going to say, ick, because I'm going to show you what if artificial intelligence was a person. Artificial intelligence does not want pleasure. We are built for pleasure. We seek pleasure, avoid pain. Artificial intelligence is always looking for pain points. Mr. Market is all, Mr. Market is a seeker of pain. Mr. Market is always looking for the painful surprises. Mr. Market is a probe. He's constantly probing for pain, for downside surprise. And then uh, the second one is, uh, this thing has a full field of vision. We have what humans have a very limited field of vision for all the things that I've discussed. The third thing is that we are, are genetically created to belong. Every group, because we, we know that if we hunt as a group, we're not going to be eaten by the tiger. If we hunt together with our spears, we're not going to get eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. We will kill it and it will, we'll be able to eat and, and get clothes, right? It never gets tired, <clears throat> and it all, it's always evolving. It's rude and fearless. It has no fear, right? So let's go to the next page, and then we can see that when groupthink is dominant, we are afraid of judgment. We quit. AI doesn't quit. Uh, when authority is dominant, we have a fear of failure. And when we have a fear of failure, we hide. We hide the ticket. We hide the research report. We hide our recommendation. We hide our price target. We hide from the private equity decisions. And then when imagination is dominant and we lack a sense of imagination, we fear the unknown. We defer. I'll do this tomorrow. You'd be amazed how many people in Hong Kong. I lived in Hong Kong for 11 years. I relocated to Singapore last year because you could see this coming a mile away. People are so full of rage in Hong Kong the last five years. And in a 
and, and, and it, the, the, the uh, best example in the world, and this is true, uh, best example in the world of how hu irrational humans are, about how, how utterly incapable we are to have any imagination when it comes to our own uh, personal safety and our personal health. So, what's your name? Maksud. Maksud. You're living in a big valley, and you have a, you have a chance to live in the valley or the hills, and there's a huge dam just got built, and you're going to get flood insurance, right? Good thing to have, right? Where is the highest proportion of people with uh, flood insurance? Uh, the top. Who agrees? That's the top. That, that makes perfect sense. Who agrees? Raise your hand. You have nobody agreeing with you. Why? Who's the least likely to have flood insurance? The people at the top. The people at the top, but the oh. company only offer. Who agrees? Who agrees with that? It is go and look at all the studies. The people who are least likely to have flood insurance, the ones right next to the dam. Why? Because why? They think they'll die. No, I don't think that's true. They can't even contemplate the possibility of a flood because they know they will be dead and so their imagination prevents them from seeing the reality and that's why people who live on the peak in Hong Kong think this is a passing problem it's no big deal don't worry about it we'll get back to normal St. Petersburg 1917 look at all of the literature that was being sent about by the elites in St. Petersburg Right, the, the, the center of one of the biggest revolutions in the, tw the biggest revolution in the 20th century, they had no idea what was happening right under their noses because they can't perceive it. Because perceiving it means that the perception of their own destruction of wealth. Right, and so, um, so that's what we have in AI. We depend on the group. AI does not. We tire easily. AI does not. We want to please and be liked. AI does not. We frighten easily. AI does not. We love pleasure. AI loves pain. If that was a human being, we would hate this person. Right? That's exactly what AI is, and that's what these tools are for, and that's the first part of the book. The next part of the book goes into a lot of the stuff, what you're going to talk about in a minute, yes. when I put you up there. And that is the way in which so much of what's happening that anybody who's working for Patau or working at Grab or working at um, Bcash or all these other things that are in Alibaba, Tencent, all of these things are taking over banks. And I want to talk about the three ways in which three particular sectors are trans being transformed into financial services. And of course, the first one is uh, payments, where we're looking at Paytm, and uh, Flipkart and Credit Karma. And we have a, a whole chapter on India in the book. Uh, and, the, and the chapter on India looks at Amazon and Flipkart, which has been acquired by Walmart, and um, a little bit what's happening with Tencent and, um, and Alibaba, and the way in which they're going at it in India, which is you know, really fascinating. Because these companies are being transformed into financial services, and I'll show you that in a minute. The next one is the way in which uh, retail is being transformed. And this is really important because a lot of you guys who are working in, in, in look, or looking at retail or looking at retail companies or retail you know, venture capital, these retail companies have tremendous value that hasn't been unlocked. Because uh, a lot of these companies are sitting on a gold mine of data and they're doing nothing with it. And you guys are like right at the edge. Like Indonesia is maybe three or four years ahead of you guys. The stuff that's going on in Indonesia is so exciting. Uh, and, and I think that's going to start happening here pretty soon. And you guys, and I, I was in Jakarta like three years ago, saying you guys have got to get on top of it. Because they got on top of the data. And of course, no company does this better than Alibaba. And, and in the case of Alibaba, you know, Jack Ma was interviewed in 2004. 15 years ago, he was interviewed, and somebody asked him, what's Alibaba? And then you would think, what's Alibaba? What do you think it is? I, what is it? Alibaba is a retail chain company. 
company and which also has upper payments and financial. Right, so re retail payments. That's what I would have said. Do you know what Jack Ma said his company was in 2004? We are an information data company. And everyone's like, what in the hell are you talking about? You're like a retail payment company. We are a data company. And he saw that 15 years ago. That's a lot of like foresight. <laughs> and it, it's, an English, it's an English interview. Go back and look at it. It's really fascinating. He got it 15 years ago. But you've got Walmart, Tokopedia, and Lazada. And Lazada and Tokopedia were kind of sleepy companies. What's going to happen to some of your sleepy companies in Bangladesh? They're going to get acquired by tech companies, and they're going to really go for it. Right? The, 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 the online is going to go backwards into the offline and really begin to move. And that's the next step in Bangladesh. And then, of course, rideshare. And, and we were talking this morning for a couple of hours on all this, you know, and what's happening with you know, a lot of rideshare companies. Uh, you know, in in, in, uh, in in Bangladesh right now, and you know, it's it's weird how <clears throat> you know Grab you know became you know completely dominant in Southeast Asia. Do you want to hear the story of how Uber left Southeast Asia? You know, did I tell you? No. <laughs> so Uber was in Jakarta. By the way, I'm not here. I'm invisible. I'm, I'm putting on my Harry Potter invisibility cloak. <laughs> uh, so Uber was in Jakarta. And dum 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 dum, they made a payoff to the Jakarta Police Department, Jakarta Metropolitan Police, which is a provincial police department. Jakarta is a province. Don't mess. <laughs> and there was an expense report that got leaked out to the Indonesian press. Did you hear this? No. Yeah. And then, so what happened was, whenever you accuse a police department of corruption, what do they do? Boy, oh boy, we're going to get to the bottom of this, for God's sake. We're going to get to the bottom of this corruption if it's the last thing we ever do. And so he, the guy was hauled in, this poor mainland Chinese guy who grew up in Hawaii, nicest guy in the world. And he was hauled in for a week of interrogation by the Jakarta police chief for a week. Um, and then, what, then who gets involved when you hear about an American company getting involved in Hanky Pank, uh, which is payoffs for an American company overseas? What's that called? Right. What? You guys have that on your CFA test. RICO, Racketeering Influence Corrupt Organization. So FBI got involved. Oh, and you want to have a, you want to have an IPO, and you're having an, inve an FBI investigation. Forget it. You will not have an IPO when you have an FBI investigation anywhere in the world. And so what do you do? You sell it. So Grab got it for nothing. They, they, I think they, they had to give up 17% of the company uh, to Uber. And uh, now Grab's worth $10 billion. So these are the kinds of things that are happening in the world now. And, and so Grab now is a, a guarantee. Grab is a, is a Singapore national champion. And, and it's now in Myanmar and Vietnam plus all of ASEAN, and so so this is what's happening. And so you see, um, you see, uh, you see this happening with Ola, Grab, Gojek, DD, and, and you know Patel is another you know, major player in, in the region. And, and so it's a really fascinating way in which you're seeing that these companies are sort of morphing into financial services. And, and, and it's happening uh, much more. Guess who wants to become the largest SME lender in ASEAN in the next five years? Grab. This is where Grab's value comes from. Clean and create. And, and you've got to make pictures. You've got to make illustrations of what's going on. That's why Python is so useful. Python deals with vast amounts of data and it does tremendous illustration of what's happening with the rate of change over time of data points relative to each other. X, Y rate of change is hard because it requires you know, four dimensionality, right? And it's the space time. And so this is where it becomes so important to have Excel, right? Forget it, right? And, and so we need Python. So you guys have got to have mandatory Python lessons in your office, like in September. Get moving, right? And then uh, I just want to show you what's going on here. 
you know, with Alibaba, for instance, in India, Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, Philippines, Bangladesh, right, with Bcash, uh, Gcash, True Money, Lazada, uh, Tokopedia, and so forth. And, and so the example I would give you with Paytm in Indonesia, I'm from California. And my bank, when I was 10 years old, I got my bank account with my, with my mom and my dad and went to the you know, bank and put $5 in and he wrote $5 in my little book. Uh, and, and, you know, and I'm only 29 and that was a few years ago. <laughs> and, and so, um, but, but look, it, it took Bank of America like 90 years to get like 15 million customers in California. 90 years to get 15 million companies. Alibaba got 250 million customers in India with Paytm in, you know, 12 months, right? And this is what's happening, right? You have a tremendous capacity to create vast bank accounts, right? Gojek has 15, Gojek has more bank accounts now than the largest bank in Indonesia. And Gojek wasn't around, you know, seven years ago. And BCA has been around for decades, 50 years, right? This is interesting companies in the world. Because Facebook Libra has a, has a capacity to easily surpass the largest bank in the world, uh, easily, uh, which I think now is either kind of ICBC. Because ICBC, the largest bank in the world by customers is uh, Agricultural Bank of China, has 350 million customers. Well, guess what? Facebook Libra will be six times larger than Agricultural Bank of China in terms of if its potential customer base. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, here is what's going on. So Tokopedia was kind of a sleepy company before. Paytm, I think Paytm would be out of business if Alibaba hadn't acquired it. I think they would be out of business because it was kind of going down. Now these are full service financial institutions. And what is happening here? Alibaba's had 15 years to perfect <coughs> its, uh, its, its platform. It's had, it's, it has a 15 year head start from anywhere else. And after our conversation today, I'm just so convinced that the United States is so afraid of Alibaba because it's utterly dominating something that you guys understand really well being in this part of the region. One of the really important parts of history always, the people who dominate one road tend to dominate globally. It's really weird. What road is that? Huh? Someone said it. What road? The Silk Road. The Silk Road is everything. Because it's basically going from Southeast Asia to Istanbul. And right now, Alibaba dominates that. And in the, in the 1800s, it was a constant uh, battle between uh, the British and the Russians for dominance of that Silk Road. Because it's, it's, it's all of your oil and your trade and your huge Asian population and the access to Europe. Uh, and and that, that's a key. It's a key. An American response to Alibaba. And this is what they're doing with these guys. So, so what they have in Paytm and Tokopedia are basically a replica of the platform that you see in China with Alibaba that they have had 15 years to perfect. And Amazon and, and Facebook are just starting this. And I always say the largest SME bank in the world should have been Microsoft 10 years ago. The largest bank in the world 10 years ago should have been Facebook. And so when I get asked by people writing stories for, like I did a thing with Forbes last week, like, to me, I said for, in Forbes, I said, I'm not surprised that it happened. I'm surprised it took so long. Like, why did it take Facebook so long to figure this out? Right? And, and, and I've done a very long report on uh, Libra. So if anybody wants it, please see me after the research, the, the, the thing, and I'll give you my research. Here's also what Amazon is doing. And by the way, I think because of Facebook Libra, the People's Bank of China is rushing forward on their own China coin. And that's going to be launched in November. 
So the, the reaction of Facebook Libra is causing China to come out with its own coin. And I believe Amazon and Apple will have their own coin and Google quickly, very quickly. So I think you guys have to have a coin here. <laughs> P coin. Yeah. No, we're going to call it the Elias coin. Uh, now, so here's uh, now here's what um, interestingly here's what um, has been done with um, Amazon between acquisitions and creation in 1824 months. Amazon has utterly and completely replaced the entire franchise of Standard Chartered with pure online activity. And so this leaves Standard Chartered in the dust. No wonder why Standard Chartered is trading at 0.5 times book, 0.4 times book. No wonder why the banks are dying. And by the way, India is one of the biggest markets in the world for Standard Chartered. And Standard Chartered, I, I, I worked for them three years ago. I went to their, uh, a, a room like this, with probably this size of room, the global technology people, and I said, you need to have a separate digital bank immediately. And they're like, it ain't gonna happen. Great idea, ain't gonna happen. The board of directors will no way. Why? We can't cannibalize our customers. First, completely stupid answer. The second one, which kills me, that's even stupider is, all the old people have money. Bullshit. <laughs> and by the way, when you talk about China, it's like these poor Chinese, you know, that they have two sets of parents, one set of parents and two sets of grandparents are gonna have to take care of. They're gonna inherit eight trillion dollars, you stupid idiot. <laughs> They're gonna inherit eight trillion dollars in cash and probably you know 20 trillion dollars in assets what is the matter with you people coca-cola only ever has only ever marketed to the younger people to get them to be a lifetime customer coca-cola doesn't care about old people they already drink coke so the banks have just a total absence of imagination complete absence of imagination right and so so this is one thing that they did uh, and so this is the problem. Here's the problem. Look at what Alibaba has on offer. Look at what Amazon has on offer. Look at what um, Walmart, even Walmart has on offer. And you can see when you compare it to HSBC and Standard Charter, nada, nothing, zilch, zippo, right? Advertising, food delivery, tickets, music, utilities, coupons, wallet, uh, voice shopping, groceries. And so I was talking to one bank group like a year ago, maybe nine, six months ago, and, the, and, and one guy's like, oh, well, you should you expect these banks to turn into grocery stores and be, you know, delivering vegetables? And I'm like, you know, you, come on, ass. You know, no, I don't expect banks And you did nothing with it. You, everybody's been buying tickets for everything for decades, and you did nothing with it. And what about um, uh, coupons? People have been clipping coupons forever, and you did nothing with it for groceries. Nothing. And you would not believe the, the amount of dollars sitting in people's drawers in, in the world for coupons is tens of billions of dollars. The whole world has tens of billions of dollars of coupons sitting in there. And, and people still, like 20% of all grocery advertising is coupons. <laughs> and the banks did nothing with this. So you know, on and on. And, and so I think there's, a, there's feedback over here, so I'm gonna go back over here. And, and so, so this is what I'm talking about, you guys. There's a total absence of imagination by the banks. And I wanna give you a quick example of that. In 1930, there were seven movie studios in the world. And they were in Hollywood, California, where I come from. Why? It's dry, it doesn't rain, and it's sunny. And it's quiet. Nobody lived there. So it, you can film all the time. It's quiet, sunny, and dry. It's perfect. That's why Hollywood started in that area. And um, there were seven movie studios who had a 95% market share in 1930 in silent movies. In 1950, how many were gone? 
six out of the seven were bankrupt, and one company was left. Now, I'm going to ask you to guess which one it is, because what came along that changed all of the silent movies? And, uh, and you can imagine, and you've heard this all the time in other technologies. Don't you like silent movies? No. <laughs> they all said, no, who's gonna who's gonna want sound? There's music and you can read the stuff on the bottom and there's reactive. Why, why do you want to have sound? Why do you want to have something else that came along? Color. Right? Something else came along. Live action animation musicals. 10 minute cartoons, uh, television came along, radio came along, right? And so what was the one company of the seven studios that still survives today because it became a lifestyle company? Disney. 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 That's the only one that survived because it grabbed on to all these new technologies and ran with them. And they, they were relentless and they would not let up. What was the word you kept talking about this morning? The, the hustle? Operation. Hustle, yeah. Walt Disney was a, a hyperactive hustler. He kept on, his, his brother was even worse. His brother was going to the banks begging for loans to do new animation. Fantasia is still one of the greatest movies ever done, 1940. It was live action animation with live music. And he was the first person to get uh, surround sound in movie studios. He went to New York himself and put the, the uh, speakers in the back and said, we're gonna have speakers in all four corners of the room for Fantasia. So this is the guy who was constantly hustling. Operational hustle, I love that phrase. And so, and so this is what, 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 how Disney survived. And, and it became a franchise lifestyle company. That is what Alibaba is. And there's every reason to look at Disney as a model for what companies in Bangladesh are gonna become like. Now here's uh, uh, Facebook Libra. On Sunday, the, that's why I knew I'm right, uh, on Sunday, the head of the PBOC said, we are, I found out from, from good sources, but the head of the PBOC said Sunday, Facebook Libra poses a real challenge to China. And I know it, I, I can't prove it, but I worked for the US government in the White House before. I'm very certain the US government is a big push behind this. Because this is a response to getting the Silk Road by Facebook Libra. For here, for Southeast Asia, for India, for the Middle East, and for, um, for the Near East. <coughs> and Anything, what's the commonality of all the companies in front of you? Except one, they're all American. First of all, Mercato Libre, I was talking to David today, <coughs> the other day, on, on the weekend, and uh, he was making the point that Mercato Libre is really the payments company for South America. <coughs> and so America's got this Monroe Doctrine, stay the hell away from South America. It's our, we're in charge of it. So Mercato Libre sort of gets a get out of jail free card and gets on this. But every one of these companies is American. And so this is gonna become an American answer to Alibaba with two billion customers. So I was talking to the lady who is the head of the FinTech for the Philippine Senate. And she was like, are you kidding me? We have 90 million people in the Philippines and 110 million Facebook accounts. And all these people do at Western Union and these other companies is rip Filipinos off of the teachers and the amas, the maids and the nurses who send money back every year. The Philippines has been ripped off of billions of dollars by Western Union. Guess what? Facebook Libra is going to charge it for free. And it's going to be free FX. And so this is going to get to 100. <clears throat> uh, you know, I was in Indonesia. I was talking to the largest bank in Indonesia. You know, people need to, you need to be joining this. It, it, you know, if, if, uh, but, but I think there's a, um, there's kind of an us versus them, I think, in this thing. Um, <laughs> I think you have to be a friend of, uh, you know, Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam. <laughs> <laughs> and not a friend of China. Um, so is Bangladesh a friend of China or Uncle Sam? Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. You want to? You're too timing. Dude, you guys are. You guys are. You guys are. No, you're hussies. That's what you are. 
you can't make your mind up. Fickle. <laughs> no, no, India is, it, the best one in the world on this is India. It's like the best one at sleeping around. India has been doing Never <laughs> part of the non-aligned movement. You guys would have known about the non-aligned, the non-aligned movement. We are in a new technological non-aligned movement. This is what is happening. The first non-aligned movement was headquartered in Bandung with Sukarno. This new non-aligned movement is headquartered in Hangzhou, China with Alibaba. That's what's going on here. <coughs> and I think that, you know, I, 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 I live in Singapore. I work with the Singapore government. I work with some of the sovereign wealth funds. One of my clients who's on the global team in Tomasek, he's a, he's a general. And he's like, what's your answer? You said both, right? What was your better answer? You had a funny one. You're kind of, you know, I think Linus is kind of, you know, sleeping around a little bit, right? <laughs> no, you know, What's yeah. the polite word for sleeping around? Well, like, you're Bangladesh, right? So, uh, <laughs> you are talking like that. Because uh, we are like between India, on side, China, the other This side. is what Singapore says. Hey, you know, we're kind of friends with both, and, uh, you know. I said, hey, what happens if the U.S. comes along and says, we're not comfortable anymore with Chinese ships coming into your port? What are you going to say to the U.S.? And he says what we have always said to the U.S. when the U.S. makes ultimatums to Singapore, go to hell. <laughs> and if we, don't, if we don't talk to the U.S. for two years, that's fine. Singapore is pretty brave, man. <laughs> so everyone's, kind of, everyone's in a very uncomfortable position. So, so this is a tension that I think is part of what I'm going to talk about in a minute about when you're making decisions with private equity about kind of where things are headed in terms of a split. I think the best way to talk about this is we're going to need two of everything. I think that's probably the best conclusion I can draw. Um, now, uh, so, so uh, we have investments. We have some of the largest private equity companies. We have uh, coin, the, 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 uh, the exchanges are going to be the biggest winners here. And then you have e-commerce. Uh, and, and part of what Libra is going to do, it's going to have an eBay function too. It's really smart. The money market fund. It's Tencent QQ, it's eBay, and it has the capital structure of the IMF. It's really, really smart. It's very, very clever. Uh, now, why I am so interested in this page is because I believe that the, com the, the one country that is further ahead than anybody else in the world in the applications of blockchain for smart cities for the financial system, for working capital, for payments, is China. China is further ahead than anybody else in the world. And they will be the first central bank to issue their China coin. And I found out yesterday it's going to be issued by the, th the big four banks and by um, Alibaba, Tencent, and UnionPay. That's very smart. And HSBC and Standard Chartered, the two banks that were originally only distributing Hong Kong dollars, right? cut out. Like, there was a big message sent in the formulation of this that this, and, and this, the, the coin's going to be, think about it, the coin's going to be M0. It's not going to be leveraged. And so the capacity for spreading RMB around the world now is going to be amazing with the coin. So this is going to be a real internationalization of the RMB. Uh, and I think the reason why China is pushing it out is because the U.S. is going to try to suffocate China's dollar access as a weapon. And so this is a big battle. This is all about the dollar, baby. <laughs> this is about maintaining the dollar strength in the world. Now, uh, what I want to show you real quick, don't pay attention. It's a little bit of a complicated uh, circle there. But this is something else. And all of you guys, and, and one of the big things about like financial analysis for, for the geeks in the room, and I, I'm, a, I'm a, a geek, the, the rate of change of working capital is what drives solvency for 80% of the companies in the world. That can be revolutionized in a third uh, part of the balance sheet where a blockchain-based system 
can match all receivables, payables, letters of credit for an entire uh, ecosystem for any logistical type of industry uh, with visibility to a group of banks. Bam. Your job is completely changed in how you analyze companies. <coughs> and banks have huge amounts of visibility. And you can no longer have constant ripoffs of letters of credit uh, with multiple hypothecation ripoffs. And if a rim company who's making a tire and the tire company and the axle company and then the car company and the distributorship all have visibility in terms of their orders, this is what blockchain can do to revolutionize working capital for SMEs. You guys have got to do that here. There's no there there here. There's no, right, there's no thing here. This is great. America has this ancient, decrepit thing that is the credit card, copper, <coughs> check, paper check thing that's 50 years old. And that's why China was able to do this so quickly. You guys will be astonished how quickly that will take off here. Because there is no there there. And because you're going to talk to the central bank and they're going to see it's in their interest. Boy, oh boy, I can tell you right now, there's a lot of talk right now today, this week, with central banks saying, holy cow, we have got to get on top of this since the PBOC is doing this. I got it, uh, my client in Toronto was like, we got a call from the Bank of Canada. The Bank of Canada is already on this. Right, so all these central banks are getting on the stick, getting with the stick, to get going on this and to force banks to get into consortium. Cloud, I don't want to talk about. It's so important. Um, on um, uh, quantum computing, there's a chapter on blockchain, very extensive chapter in applications. Uh, I won't talk about this much either, but there's a chapter on quantum computing that is really important. Uh, I think one of the industries that's going to get more money than any other industry in the world in the next three years, that one. <laughs> there's going to be money pouring into this because people have woken up to the reality that this is coming down the pike. This is the new race for the atom bomb. Because the guy who gets quantum computing first will be able to crack everybody else's code. And if you don't have it, you will, every single thing that you have will be cracked. And don't forget how long it took for the Americans to crack the Japanese code um, in, in, before World War II. It took about four years to crack magic. And then for cracking Ultra uh, in Germany, that took about four years to crack. Quantum computing can crack any code in 24 hours. And it can crack the new code in 24 hours and then it can crack the new code in 24 hours. So nothing will be, um, right, will be, will be, uh, everything will be able to be deciphered. So this is the ultimate atomic bomb. Uh, so either you're gonna wanna get it, or steal it, or buy it. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like bomb, like, like atomic, you know, uh, weapons. <coughs> Here is where I'm gonna end with, then you're gonna talk. <clears throat> so that I give you lots of food for thought, right? Yeah. Stirring your stew. Okay, and so uh, this is how I want to end. Uh, as, uh, raise your hand if you've ever heard of NQTEL, raise your hand. NQTEL. NQTEL is the uh, private capital, venture capital, private equity fund, whatever you want to call it, for the CIA. And NQTEL funded a small company that was number 14 in search engines about 15 years ago. Anyone know what the 14th largest uh, search engine that nobody ever heard of and nobody cared about 15 years ago until the CIA funded? Right? Funded by the CIA. 168 companies are currently funded by the CIA in California. So, and I worked in the White House, and I can assure you that when we make comparisons between the way in which the Chinese state sort of manages and um, maneuvers various technologies, there is not that much different in the way that America does it. 42% of the American economy is government. And so this pure capitalism in America thing is total crap. 
And, and so, so what I want to show you is that here we have a world of AT&T, Verizon, the NSC, that's where I worked before, Department of Defense, CIA, NSA, NQTEL, Palantir, and then Qualcomm, Apple, Facebook, Google, Amazon. This is coalescing into one group. <clears throat> and that's got a lot of political baggage. Because um, Peter Thiel, who's the CEO of Palantir, had a harangue in the Washington Post accusing, guess who, of treason. And that they should be investigated by the FBI. <laughs> Google. Because Google is working with China, and Google turned down Department of Defense contracts from weapon systems that were offensive to the employees of Google. And so he accused Google of treason. In America, that's a death penalty. So this is like crazy talk. But this is how weird America's getting. And on the other side, this is the world of you know, Huawei and the Ministry of State Security, State Council, the big mama, the big mothership. Mothership China, China Development Bank. That's like everything. They are in 110 countries and have one of the biggest balance sheets, one of the biggest secret balance sheets in the world, right? They're like mothership China. And then you've got Alibaba and Tencent. You have WeChat and Ant. And you have AliCloud and Tencent Club. AliCloud totally And you guys are in this weird thing. And we were just talking this morning that you saw yesterday that because China had backed Pakistan in Kashmir, that India is calling for a ban on like Chinese imports. And it's like, guys, come on, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's weird, right? And so I think that will simmer down, but this is just what's going on here. Uh, and of course, India hasn't decided who it wants to be sleeping with recently. Uh, and uh, India is really good. India is very good at uh, playing both sides. In the 70s and 80s, India played the U.S. and the USSR like a fiddle. They were really good at it. <laughs> and Pakistan is pretty good at it, too. And so this is going to be a real difficult one. I think we're going to be in a world of having two of everything. That's my sense. And there's a whole chapter on, in the book on this. And so, so I'm going to stop it at that. You're going to talk, and then you can stay a little bit for Q&A, and then you have to leave. So give me your thoughts on sort of payments and, and, and the online world reaching back into the offline world and how do we monetize data for financial services?